Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Livio. I'm a core developer at OpenSips, and uh, we're uh, going to we're going to go through oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> some uh, some of the features I worked on for uh, for 3.0 release and uh, kind of give you an insight into how we took the decision to go with them and uh, um, yeah, let's jump uh, straight into it. Uh, these are some uh, some tags you could you can use to to uh, see to follow me on Twitter, IRC, uh, whatnot. And um, uh, before uh, before starting, I um, I wanted to go a bit into what exactly is this buzzword that we've been uh, uh, hearing these days, the, the DevOps, and uh, go into a little bit of history behind it and what's the the idea. And uh, uh, the, an interesting parallel to it is uh, with the Agile movement uh, during the early 2000 years. Uh, does anyone remember about, about that period? Uh, and uh, basically, people were kind of getting fed up with the 1970s towards early 1990s uh, way of doing things where uh, everything kind of looked like this, where you... It was very, the, the development was very rigid. You had the requirements, then the design, then the implementation, then you verify, and then you realize it took one whole year to get that thing done, and there is not even a use for it anymore. Um, so uh, th that's where the, the agile buzzword came in, and uh, it really revolutionized how software was built. And uh, pretty much DevOps aims to do the same thing. Uh, it's not an actual, uh, actually recognized practice or uh, uh, specific, uh, it does not have a specific connotation to it. It's more likely each uh, each one's understanding of what DevOps is, uh, but it's more or less a, uh, a gap bridge between development and operations and the philosophy that uh, each of them should know a bit of the other one's work and uh, we should, uh, this this cooperation leads to a much better product and a much faster time. And uh, in OpenSIPS, we've uh, we've actually took care of some uh, of each of uh, of the aspects of DevOps in, and built these ideas into the 3.0. Uh, and the first one I'm going to start covering is the script development, where uh, we noticed a um, a strong increase in the need for templating the config files or deploying it in a massive uh, to a lot of uh, multi-node infrastructures and as fast as possible and as uh, often as possible. So uh, this is uh, to go through uh, some give you some ideas that what the templating can do for you. Um, uh, so I, I said, talked about this the the one-click deploy to to a into a to configure the script into a multitude of variants. Um, one other possible benefit would be that uh, you get to select the features you have in your script. So, um, so uh, uh, you might have the same core platform that's generic uh, obtained through the templating engine, but now you selectively enable some features. Uh, to, to each customer that you, you deploy to. And possibly you could argue that uh, another benefit could be um, a way to adapt to the environment that is also enabled by uh, strong uh, templating languages, such as Jinja's, Jinja 2, for example, where uh, it can you can actually uh, iterate through the, uh, for example, network interface cards that might be available on a given box. And uh, this again saves you even more headaches of uh, having to customize the script for uh, each target server. It, it all just works. And uh, you might argue that, wait, we already had this. Uh, uh, Nick, I'm not sure if I can spot him uh, in this room, but Nick actually did the commits five years ago. <laughs> he, he added uh, the M4 support. Uh, into the packaging, uh, into the OpenSys packages. But actually, there, we noticed that um, 
as we went along and used this that there are some limitations to, to it. For example, you were stuck with M4. Um, if you had to, if you wanted to choose a different templating language, you would pretty much have no packaging support for it and you'd have to, uh, again, make some, uh, some time investments uh, in that area. And uh, also, uh, there, there, there's this intricate problem that uh, you have to manage two files and uh, you, you have this line error uh, reporting problem between them. And I'm going to show a little bit uh, the idea here is that um, if we take like an M4 templating, templated file and I numbered the lines from 1 to 11, um, this is how we, it would, uh, the process file would look. I would have uh, those if that's our, our, uh, our screen now. And we have uh, some typo. Uh, you would obviously get a nice error at line 2332 in there. Um, but uh, I guess I could have I could have shown the actual bracket problem. Um, but the whole point is that uh, th th these <coughs> subtle differences are enough to point the error from one route to another route. And uh, that pretty much makes it crazy hard to debug uh, little errors like one missing uh, bracket. <laughs> We actually can, can can take quite quite like ten minutes to to, to troubleshoot one one bracket. So um, we we tried to tackle this problem, and uh, we couldn't. We, we didn't go with uh, reinventing the wheel and uh, making get another preprocessor into OpenSIP script because that uh, would we would have to. It would be limited, so we wouldn't have that. Uh, the earlier benefits I mentioned with the uh, looping over uh, some arrays and no complex types, list dictionaries. And um, that was when uh, a uh, fine gentleman from our team stepped up and uh, he just said, guys, we, th this is an easy problem to solve. It's, it's, uh, it's straightforward and uh, the solution, so his idea, and it looks like this. Um, so, in order to, we we mark each line with a uh, with a number, and uh, once and then run the preprocessor, whatever in whatever language uh, it's implemented in, and you end up with the clean version. But now you have the uh, the semantics of the actual lines. So that when you have the typos that I mentioned earlier, the missing tokens, it is able to pinpoint the precise uh, point and on the original file where the, the, the where your error was. Um, so this uh, this solves that that dreaded issue, and uh, it the usage looks uh, is hasn't actually changed much. You can still uh, run the old plug the CFG file like you did before, but uh, you can also add the preprocessor uh, element to it now and uh, also accept M4 inputs or uh, in what, what, uh, whatever language of your choosing is. It's, uh, so like I said, I don't want to uh, go too much into this. There are uh, some Jinja 2 examples, some Ruby. Uh, you can follow these along with the uh, in the manual, there is a new section over there with uh, templating CFG files, and uh, yeah, that's uh, with the preprocessor. And uh, moving on to a uh, different section of the DevOps process, the testing and uh, QAing uh, platforms, we've uh, worked a bit on the memory allocator support, and uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, description of how it works because I don't see this uh, being talked about too often and maybe it, uh, I thought it was a good uh, occasion to to go into a bit more detail here um, how the open system man memory managers work and uh, what we can expect out of each of them and uh, how we can make the best selection for our use case and uh, as with any C application 
you have the core uh, libc allocation functions, right? Your malloc free and rea uh, reallocation function. And, but in OpenSafe, we have these wrappers on top of them. Uh, and uh, each of them, each of the set of functions corresponds to different uh, allocators that we, or so we call them. And um, basically what happens is that when OpenSIP starts, it reserves the whole chunk that you specify uh, in the uh, memory command line arguments. And this is, uh, and then it proceeds to micromanage each chunk. That's, that's the, the gist of it. Uh, and this is why it's not a good idea to monitor. So OpenSIPs, uh, start, people who are starting with OpenSIPs often uh, report that, hey, but my uh, OpenSIPs has plenty of memory because they're using, they're monitoring the resident set size of the process. And uh, it, it'll just be a straight line. It never changes. And uh, for OpenSIPs, that's why it's a uh, different and unique application. Uh, the way to monitor memory usage is by using its internal reporting. So you have to use the, uh, the get statistics uh, interface and only then are you able to graph uh, the usage and uh, know what to expect of it. Uh, right, so a little bit about each allocator. Um, uh, the first one and the, the one that's default in, uh, in the production build, it's the fast allocator. Um, it's pretty much uh, the one you definitely need to go with once you you know that your system is stable. And uh, uh, the good thing about it is that it also has memory leak uh, debugging support. So uh, you can uh, hook that in whenever you, you have these types of issues. Uh, but whenever you have more ugly issues that uh, th these are the, the kind of the, uh, costliest things to debug with. Uh, with this is a, a direct consequence of dealing with custom memory allocators in the first place, but I guess it's what happens when you uh, prioritize performance a lot. You run into these. Uh, you, you may shoot yourself in the foot. Is that the, uh, the corruption, the memory corruptions that uh, and we've addressed this with, uh, with the QA allocator, which has some additional sanity, sanity checks built into it. And uh, last but not least, the high performance allocator. Uh, this one is useful if you have a, a multi-core environment, if you're pushing a lot of calls per second through that open SIPs, and uh, you want to uh, uh, parallel, do a highly parallel uh, workload. And uh, this is where F malloc kind of um, runs into his limitations because it actually has a global lock. And uh, the, the idea behind the HP is that we want to reduce contention on that lock. And again, you can, at least it has memory leak debugging, just like all of them. Uh, but as far as sanity checks, uh, they're not available here. So it's always a, uh, a trade-off. So, the problem was that uh, all of this magic was only available at compile time. And uh, a lot of users were uh, ending up on the mailing list saying, okay, my OpenSIPS has some sort of uh, issue and what's the next step to do? And then we're, okay, let's recompile and let's see what the issue is. And uh, they, they're like, but I installed from packages and I'm not that good with uh, the, the installing from source. Maybe I don't want to do it. And uh, okay, we, we took care of this issue by uh, actually embedding all the allocators. We refactored uh, all that uh, memory managing code and uh, starting with 3.0, they're all baked into there. And we added some, uh, some new command line options uh, that allow you to just select uh, whatever uh, allocating combinations you want to, that are required for your scenario. Uh, so you can either choose a global allocator for both. Uh, yes, and also worth mentioning is that you can even do it as granular as at shared memory or private memory level. So that's, uh, that's an added bonus. Um, so you either get to set the global one or go into sp the, the specific ones and just uh, debug uh, a specific segment. For example, I'm going to go through some possibly useful use cases. Um, 
just going through a few examples, normally we would run with fast, the fast allocator for both private and shared. Uh, but if we have a package memory corruption, we would switch only the, the package, the, the private memory allocator, to debugging mode, whereas preserve speed on the other one. Similarly, for uh, shared memory corruptions, we would switch uh, the minus S option. Uh, uh, also, for leak debugging, we just enable each of them's debugging flavor. So uh, maybe these tables should be on the website somewhere. <coughs> Um, and uh, right, these are only for uh, l low amount of parallelism. I guess eight cores is pretty high, but uh, the, you can run actually open sips on a, a lot, uh, and people do run it on a lot higher uh, and more powerful servers, 16 core, 20 core. Um, and here you would actually opt for it's, and in our experience, it's a better idea to go for the high performance allocator, at least for the. <coughs> or only for the shared memory segment because that's where all the concurrency <coughs> takes place. And last but not least, the development side where you don't care about overheads and uh, waste, wasteful CPU or memory, you just enable debug for everything and don't and forget about it because it will uh, give you the uh, best feedback uh, with regards to whatever it is that you may have done wrong. <laughs> and um, that was the, um, this sums up the operations, the, sorry, the QA side of things for 3.0. And uh, to, to end it, we also thought a bit about the operations side. And uh, uh, we, I'm going to go into how we actually came up with the, the diagnosis idea. Actually, uh, Bogdan came up with, uh, he's the, the, the brains behind it. And, uh, the core is pretty much uh, this. Where there is the basic perception, or, or at least there is the tendency to oversimplify um, when you are thinking about monitoring an open SIPs instance, right? You're thinking, okay, how many things could there be to monitor? Maybe one, two, or three. Is it running? Is it stuck? And right, but it actually turns out there are a lot of subcomponents to it. It there's a lot of things to, uh, as time has, has passed, we've uh, added, uh, based upon user requests, all sorts of, uh, we have, we've added additional backends, uh, we've added uh, HTTP integrations, we've added HEP integrations, uh, the NoSQL databases, uh, clustering support, and all of these uh, may be a problem at some point. Uh, and, um, Sometimes the, the problem is hidden, whereas one subsystem, uh, so just to, to actually work on an example, if, uh, if the NoSQL database is slow, and I'm specifically talking about MongoDB here, um, that might halt the SIP processing. So th what you see is an effect <coughs> at, at log level, right? The logs will say, okay, the SIP is slow. Um, but given that you have only, you know, a, short amount of uh, time to figure out what's going on on that server and uh, restore the service, that can be pretty tricky to, to figure out. So um, the problem, the problem statement actually it, it was like this. So using this a standard toolkit that we provide with the package, how long does it take to diagnose a service affecting issue if you're woken up, if you're paged at 3 a.m.? And with the current state of things, that takes minutes. It, you have to dig through the logs. You have to, uh, um, I mean, I'm assuming you haven't invested the effort to build your own custom uh, web interface and monitoring around it, uh, because we pretty much, for up until now, we forced you to do that. But we want to, to help in this direction and provide maybe a basic tool, a, uh, a quick way to figure out what's going on there and where do I need to, to act. And uh, the, the CLI has helped a lot here in that uh, it's very modular and we, oh, I could only, I had the, the luxury to only focus on, on the module itself and not on it, anything else around it. Uh, we came up with a diagnose command. And uh, the idea is to bring, this, bring that troubleshooting time down to the order of seconds. 
if we take a look on the screen, it uh, it is assessing uh, instantly the capacity of the SIP workers, um, the state of the shared memory, uh, and not just the instantaneous usage. It also looks a bit um, in the past and uh, lets you know, um, I guess that there is a different screen for that. Anyway, it will let you know if you've had some sort of dangerous peak usage at some point and it will give you some hints. Maybe you should restart within the next uh, maintenance window and give it some more memory. Um, so same goes for private memory. And uh, towards the bottom section are the blocking uh, queries, your uh, DNS, your SQL and uh, no SQLs, each of them with uh, their, their troubleshooting uh, sub modules. And uh, as far as architecture goes, uh, the diagnose <coughs> works uh, by first subscribing uh, to the to the open SIPs using the FIFO file. And uh, once it does that, it will start receiving events via JSON RPC uh, over on port 8888. And at the same time, um, so using these events, it will uh, it will gradually accumulate this data. Um, it doesn't store anything uh, on the disk. So uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, if, if you notice here, it, it temporarily accumulates them and gives you that uh, that feedback uh, that what has been happening. So you have to give it a bit of, of time to, to get some data and uh, give you an assessment. We've thought about, again, it's, uh, you, we can complicate this as much as we want. Uh, and uh, for example, we could store statistics inside a time series database and uh, go with that. But uh, also, we can we can develop a connector in the CLI to to be compatible with such data that you might store to the to some InfluxDB or Prometheus or not. Um, uh, but and also right. So this uh, I've talked about one side, the event collection, and at the same time it looks at the statistics, <coughs> so raw stats about each of the core components, and using this information. Um, for example, here the, with the DNS queries, it is able to give us insights into which are the slowest queries which have been uh, happening in the last seconds, which are some constantly slow, slow queries or repetitive, repetitively uh, being slow. And uh, lastly, some, some percentage of how many of them are being slow. Again, this is using the thresholds. For those of you who know, there are uh, some global threshold parameters you can define in open SIPs. By default, they're disabled. So uh, you have to set those if you want the CLI to pick these stats up. Um, so in a similar manner, you, get, you can get feedback out of your SQL queries. Um, here we have uh, similarly the, the top worst queries and the constantly slow ones. Uh, no SQL pretty much the same. And then we move into the memory insights. And um, here we get the, the current usage and peak usage, and it will give us some feedback on that. We, well, we'll actually uh, you'll see more of this on uh, Thursday, where we'll do the demo. And uh, yeah, lastly, it's the it's tip of how you can best uh, assist OpenSIP. So, you should increase the, the memory. You should uh, also that there's like a call it uh, severity of uh, of the, the log. I guess that's going to be useful as well. Um, and lastly, the load troubleshooting. Uh, this is a pretty, uh, or maybe it's it's worth mentioning a bit about uh, who is who here is familiar with the load stats that were pushed in 2.4. And who are you? Who are using them? Okay, we, we have. So uh, it's even more useful to than, than I thought to talk about them. So what does the these load stats uh, mean? Actually, they measure how much time the workers are spending uh, processing SIP. So that might be anything, right? From actually doing some header parsing, whatever logic you have in the scripts, or 
doing SQL queries, staying blocked, uh, waiting for to push out the message. They are doing processing effectively. They are not uh, polling and waiting. So that's the the percentage they are spending doing something as opposed to just staying stuck. So that, that is the these are the load stats, and the CLI tool picks up each interface you have defined in the script, each listener, whether if, if it's UDP, TCP, HEP, uh, STCTP, whatever. And uh, it is giving you some info on how much data is pending on that socket. And uh, this, is, this is totally decoupled from OpenSIP statistics. It actually uses uh, some, Python, some Python module to monitor the OS CPU usage. It also correlates uh, this as well with the with the load, so it it is able to tell whether you have an I/O problem or if you are CPU or if OpenSIPS is CPU bound. Case in which that, that, that's pretty bad. If you if you're CPU bound, you you cannot solve it by adding more cores, I guess. Or yeah, it's, if you're using all of them, you you have to add more boxes then. Um, so this is as far as the, the load troubleshooting goes. And uh, uh, I guess this is, that's not very precise. Yeah, and this is the, the brief overview. It's just diagnose, not diagnose load. Uh, giving you the, the summary I, I talked about earlier. And uh, yeah, that's as far as the, the operations uh, help that we've added into 3.0. And uh, yeah, that's it's. Uh, we put in a lot of work into it, and uh, although it's it may seem like a minor bump in version, it's just a number. We think it's going to be a major leap in user experience. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I have time for one question. Who's it going to be? One. This man in the back rows his hand first. Kiran. Yeah, the diagnostics, the diagnosis command is looks really good. I was just wondering, I mean, do they provide, I mean, the system goes to critical. Yes. Do they also provide any sort of attendee traps or, or anything that monitors can pick up? So the question is, oh, I guess you're using a mic. <laughs> um, uh, w whether if SNMP or um, Monit can pick up? Or? Yeah, so uh, does that also raise any SNMP traps so that you know, we can react to that one? Yes, there is no hook into the CLI currently, but we can complicate it, like I said, as much as we want. There's uh, and as far as open SIPs, SNMP events, that's a whole another uh, story, right? Where you can you can uh, we can export the stats as well for, for those. Yes, yeah, so the producers on these anyway, and the diagnosis is just a way for us to find out what is going on. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that, that much about the OpenSIP SNMP uh, export and statistics, but um, from from what I know, it they're configurable, right? They're um, you can define those uh, those stats to export. Yeah. I like that question. So basically, you're going to be looking into trying to find ways to export some of this stuff as well from the CLI. Mm. You said it could be done. It's You're on the spot. spot. Absolutely. Do it, man. <laughs> Let's get a round of applause for the view. Thank you so much. Yeah, 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 yeah.